get started. Okay, we are now recording. Everybody, thank you for coming. My name is Mary Pagano, and um, I'm one of the board advisors for HERA. I also uh, work for HERA TV, um, founded that. Um, and we're today we're going to spend an hour on the fifth dimension. And we're going to hear from our, and by the way, so you all know, I've already posted in the links uh, here in the chat. So, and if you click the three buttons at the very end of this event, you can save everything that goes on. So, um, um, I've already listed out websites on Harris City. I've, I've listed website for where you can find out more about the fifth dimension. Um, I've also given you the website on uh, Hera TV, so you can go and play it back. Um, let's see here, what else am I missing? Nothing. So I'm gonna, I wanna introduce Emmanuel Pimenta. He is a composer, an author, um, an architect. And in our community, we call him the Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci of our time. No, no, <laughs> Sorry, I said it, I said it. No. Yes. <laughs> no. I said it. I said it. I agree. Thank you, thank you. Hey, you what I go no, yeah, 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 yeah. You are expelling me. <laughs> so anyway, Emmanuel, I'm gonna turn this over to you. You share your deck. And if everybody wouldn't mind muting your phones or muting, muting your computer so we don't have any distraction from him. And then we'll get into questions later. Okay. So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to he be here with you all. I'd like to thank uh, Maria Melanie Puri, oh, who I love very much. And she is a great, great person, great woman. And uh, she created her project. That is a project for the future of humanity. And uh, it's a wonderful project. I think that you all should know better. Someone is here, no? I'm looking to. Is Marcus Novak? I think so. That doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. And I would like to thank a lot, Mary Pagano, also, uh, director of the Hera TV. It's, I have no words to thank you all, and you all for your presence. I am very, very sad because I cannot embrace you yet. But soon I hope that we will we'll get together and it will be possible to do that. So, you know, I launched, I released uh, 30 books that is uh, titled The Fifth Dimension. Uh, they were written in the 90s. And um, I tell the entire story, how it started, how this project evolved and so on. And they will not repeat here because it's in the website also. It's easy to see. So what are you trying to do is to give you an idea about what, what is inside the first books. Of course, it's very, very uh, superficial, no? because in a half hour, some minutes, it's impossible to, uh, to, to, to talk about 30 books, no? it's crazy. Uh, but everything starts and the book starts also with an image that I'd like you to think with me. Remind please, when you were a child, when we were children, do you remember? A small piece of stone could be a rocket. A pencil could be a, a ship. Um, anything could be anything. It was a parallel world to our concrete world. And do you remember when we had friends together, we shared that unbelievable world, that parallel magical world. And the, the first books deal basically with this, this parallel world that makes us human. And uh, uh, let me see one thing. I, I will share with, with you some information, some image. But before, just to, to say another thing, you can ask me, but why the title of the fifth dimension? 
So I took this title from a sentence or a phrase by a great thinker, a great um, sociologist, a German sociologist that was Norbert Elias. So let me put here. Uh, okay. No, 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 no. Just a second, please, because it was in the last image. Just one second. Uh, I need to be faster. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> this was a mistake, error. Okay, now I can go back to you. Just a second. Okay. I'm very sorry. It's okay. So, Norbert Elias said, by acquiring the skill of sending and receiving messages in the codified form of a social language, persons can gain access to a dimension of the universe, which is specifically human. They continue uh, located in four dimensions of space-time, like all pre-human events, but are in addition as human beings located in a fifth dimension. He wrote this, it was in a Posmos book, published in 91, he passed away in 90, and the symbol theory. And this, I found that this was so proper to what I was telling the book, in the books, no? <clears throat> this virtual, organism, a live organism that is, lives in symbiosis with us and what makes us human. Uh, I have written about this since the 80s. And uh, this look at, for me, look at as a very, very good uh, title for the books. Here you have the image of Norbert Elias, who lived in eight, between 1897 and 1990. And there is a clue for us to understand this process of the parallel world that is very interesting. That is uh, the most famous case, poli police case in German in the 19th century. It was Kaspar Hauser. Kaspar Hauser was a 15 years old boy who was found uh, quite in silence in the square of Nuremberg uh, in 1828, and he was unable to speak, to understand, to exchange ideas, to talk, to, to make anything. All the, his uh, cognitive system was impaired. He had just one letter in his pocket, <clears throat> written by his mother, and she, she never identified herself, but she said that uh, Kaspar Hauser had been an accident, not wished son, and so she closed him in a cage for 15 years, mm. not talking to him. And he was impaired, so the brain was impaired, had lots of problems. Uh, he, he became a handicapped in cognition terms, cognitive terms. And uh, okay, this shows us that we are former, but what is around us, the environment, who we are, who we are is what we live. And this leads us to the concept of neuroplasticity about which I have worked since the eighties also. No? Uh, the story of uh, Kaspar Hauser probably is fake, is not totally true. But since then, we found we have known, we knew, and we have known about lots of cases, similar cases with the same results. So in 74, 1974, Werner Herzog, that is a very, very interesting filmmaker, German film director, made the movie, The Enigma of Kaspar Hauser. If you can watch this movie, it's very interesting. Okay, but we can ask how all this started. No? 
how this process is started, from where we are going, where you come from, no? And so we have the figure of Terence McKenna, who was an, uh, an American anthropologist who lived between 1946 to the year 2000. Unfortunately, he passed away too early. And he made a very interesting discovery that uh, and established a, a, a hypothesis. He found in the North Africa uh, a place where people who pre-humans, you know, pre what we are now, lived for thousands of years there. And this place was, archaeological research showed that this place was very, very rich of uh, hallucinogenal ma mushrooms, the magic mushrooms. And his theory is that the pre-human, if you can say that, populations that lived there for uh, thousands of years used these mushrooms and created with making a brain transformation by neuroplasticity, created a parallel world that made us human. And so it's so fantastic, this possibility and this, this is a very polemic hypothesis uh, that is, there are many anthropologists that, and also archeologists that uh, are not, don't agree with that. But I think that is very interesting and it deserves some attention for us. So 170,000 years later, we had the first, uh, paintings in caves in Europe. That was uh, key. here we have the Chauvet cave in France. And I explained this in length in the book with time showing many examples how this was developed and so on. Because the logic in these drawings is a different logic of what we are used to. No? Uh, it's very, very interesting. But this, I need also to tell you another story. Uh, I started uh, researching the theory of thoughts, particularly of uh, Charles Sanders Peirce in the early 80s, 1980, 81. And uh, quickly, three, four years later, I always, uh, even today, I love Charles Sanders, Charles Sanders Peirce. Charles Sanders Peirce was one of the greatest philosophers ever. And uh, I study him even today. But three or four years after my beginning, studying deeply, studying Peirce, I was obliged to start studying a neurology. And so I did. But I needed an orientation. So I said, oh, wait, wait a minute, how can I, I do that, not to have an orientation on this field? And I wrote to Gerald Adelman, the Nobel Prize in 1972. I confess to you that I did not believe he would reply to me, but he replied, he was one of the important people in my life. Because he replied, he sent me bibliography, lists of papers and books, his papers, his books, and so on. He sent me a lot of information and he guided me in many senses. Before I contact, had contacted him and I wrote and published this, I had an hypothesis of the plastic uh, formation of, of synaptical patterns. That is our brain connections, how they happen. So after sensory inputs, after the stimulus of uh, space and time, depending on the logic that is there, we design the pressure clouds of electrical connections inside our brain. And uh, uh, Gerald Edelman was researching, was studying at that moment, the uh, plastic formation of specialized groups of neurons after the uh, principle of natural selection. So it was amazing because I learned a lot about that and that gave me um, a new dimension. No? And we met personally in Lisbon in the 90s. 
he was a very, very interesting person. So this image is uh, the patterns that are formed after the touching of a hand, but the hand is virtual, is mathematical. And these patterns are the conclusion by the process of natural selection, what happens inside our brains. I give you another example. Uh, at that time, you know, PET scanning was not so uh, used. No, it was too expensive and so on. But soon we had lots of images of PET scanning. No? Here we have on the top uh, the image of our brain rehearsing words verbally. And in the bottom, we have visualizing these same words. Mm. Look that we activate different zones of the brain. When you have red, it's more energy. When you have blue, it's less energy. But even so, it's touched, it's activated there. So when you have more or less energy, we are creating clouds of uh, synapses that attract neurons, functionalizes a, a certain area changing our brain. Our brain is always changing. Two things that we learned, many of us learned in the, when we were child, or not so child, teenagers, is that the neuro, when is died, is died. It's finished. And the other thing is that the brain never changes. These two laws are fake, they're false, they doesn't exist. Uh, we are always changing, our brain is always changing, and we have also the new genesis, but I will not speak now about that. So to make even clearer to you what I'm talking about, this transformation of the brain, we have an, an example made by the neuroscientist, Eleanor Maguire. She is a British scientist, a British, a British neurologist, and she made a wonderful thing. In the year 2000, she made uh, more than 1,000 tomographies in uh, the brains of taxi drivers in London. And what she found that the hippocampus, that is our area in the brain, responsible for fa facial recognition, for navigation, but also to fix long, uh, long memory, from short memory uh, information, but this is another thing, was larger, much larger in the taxi drivers before the GPS, of course, than, now, than the average of people. Wow, this is unbelievable. They were not born with this change in the brain. So after that, we discovered also that, for example, violin players have in the uh, brain, have a sector of the brain responsible for the left hand much larger than uh, average person. If we study something very different now, start now for one year, for example, and you made a tomography in your brain, after one year, your brain will, will be changed, physically changed. Isn't that amazing? So what happened about 8,000 years ago, or 8,000 years BC, to be more precise, we created in Sumeria the whale. So you imagine when you have, for example, uh, our bodies, we look at the outside, up, down, it's organic. And we, when we are in a horse, on a horse, it's the same process. We look to all sides and up, down, and so on. We, we, it's organic, it's a movement, an organic movement. But when we have a vehicle with wheels, is a straight line. And we started to uh, change our brands. Okay, I will not explain here because it's too long, but when we do that many times, we change with optical flux. We change some certain connections in our brain, turning us more able to catch uh, closed sets of information. And we started to do that. Amazing. So here we start with a wonderful figure. 
Denise Shaman Besserat. She is, uh, I, how can I tell you? She is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. She discovered the beginning of writing. So she, she discovered that in the prehistory, we developed tokens like this you are looking. And each token meaning something. For example, one token can mean carrots and the other cows and so on. Huh? So imagine that two people were making a business, business. And so one guy gave to the other one 50 cows and said, from today, one year from today, you will return the 50 cows. But you need to memorize that. If you don't have a memory about that moment, these 50 cows can be transformed in 48, 49, or 51, 52, you don't know. So what they did, they took the tokens of a call and put in a jar, Adobe jar, and close it, 50 tokens there. No? So one year after, they broke the, the, the jar and uh, discovered that there was 50 uh, tokens, 50 cows. So no problems. We had the business was made and you have the both parts safe. Until one day that someone imagined, oh, wait a minute, why do you need to, do we need to put 50 tokens inside the jar? If we can engrave on the face, on the surface of the jar, the image of this token in place to put the tokens inside, I you design. Worldwide. So she and, and, uh, contacted you, we spoke with her about creating Terra Profu. Sorry? Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Okay. So what happened? The, the jar was no longer necessary and cuneiform was born. Cuneiform was born in this way. And this, for example, is a tablet uh, requiring the allocation of beer in the 1300s BC. After the cuneiform, we had the hieroglyphs in, uh, in Egypt. This is 1320s BC. And here it, star it starts a, a new process. Uh, we can see what happened that. In that world, everything was made from outside to inside. So for example, in Egypt, we had grids where you did draw it on the block of stone, the, the, the drawing, the design that you wanted to carve. You carved the block of stone and you had the sculpture. You can see this, you watch this image and it's clear. You, it's almost, you can see the block of stone there. It's almost no movement of the figures because everything is from outside to inside. And here it starts a, a phenomenal, a big transformation, transformation that starts what we call the Western civilization, if you want, that is our prefrontal. Our prefrontal sexual in our brain is here in front. And it, it's responsible for the organization of the entire brain. For example, you are listening to me and you are listening to sounds, but you are, associating to uh, images and to meanings, words and everything, isn't it? And you are looking to images also and you are connecting everything. All this is made by the prefrontal. So uh, when we exercise the prefrontal, we transform it. And we started, it happened a very a, a fantastic phenomenon. In Phoenicia, we started with the phonetic alphabet. And the Greek in, started importing the phonetic alphabet, associ associating it to the papyrus, and added the vowels. But I, I not talk about the vowels now. The fusion of the papyrus and the phonetic alphabet produced an, an intense tool of sensor exercise. The guy manual physiologic physiologically changing our brain, physiologically changing. 
this is what we call that is the book. When you read a lot of book or books or the writing, you become more able to plan your life, everything. It's okay. What happened there is that this intensification that lasts from the 1500s no, to the uh, 700 approximately, uh, generated what we call the Greek miracle. So the transformation was so fantastic that time, for example, before that was before and after. And with the Greek miracle, time became past, present, and future. We became much more able to plan. We had the figure on uh, the ground. We have the interior uh, words of poetry and uh, uh, theater. And you have many, many examples. And we have the emergence of negative freedom. Negative freedom is very easy. My right goes up to when your right uh, 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 ends. No, my, my right ends when your right starts. Huh? This is the negative freedom. We started, we started with the state of law, democracy, pathos. Pathos emerged for the first time in uh, the, about the year 600 BC. And we have here for the first time the criticism of culture. That is, the uh, plus representation manifestation is no longer to illustrate something. It's no longer decoration. It's no longer for something. No, it's the criticism of how we see the world. Criti criticism here is not the, to deny, it's not the, to negate. No, criticism is from Krypton, that is, to uh, reveal, to naked, to expose something that was hidden, for example. No? And we have, we have this for the first time. So the artwork, we can say like that, starts with this, the criticism of knowledge. This is the, what we call as artwork. And do you want to see what happened? Do you remember that sculpture? in Egypt, and here we are not uh, making any judgment of value. We are just looking at the history. Here is Phidias. Look, the movement is the same stone, but look the body, because now is the relations of the body that are talking to us. And it's the, everything as a process is from inside to outside. It's totally changed, absolutely. And if you see this in uh, painting, for example, we have here, for example, Pels, who lived in the, about 300 so BC. This is a reconstruction in Pompeii, but gives us a clear image of the uh, transformation of the plastic representation. What happened? We had the Greece, we had Rome, and everything flourished there in this way, on this sense. But in the third century, this, uh, third century of our age, our year, uh, Alexander was destroyed. Alexander was destroyed several times. He and was many times destroyed inside, internally. But Alexander was the producer of papyrus for Europe. So it was thanks to Alexander that we had these two sensory to sensory exercise to that turned Europe, Europe. Huh? And then it finished from one day to the other practically. And we enter in the Middle Ages here. For example, Via de Honicourt, who was considered the most, one of the most important artists of his time in 1200s. Well, okay, again, is not to make any judgment of that. I, personally, I love the other Honicourt. But what happened in the year 1000, we were all those 800 years without uh, papyrus. But in the year 1000, and I explained this in the, the book deeply, uh, we started producing uh, paper in Valencia, in Spain, 
and in Fabriano in Italy, first in Valencia, near, very near Valencia. And we had the Romanesque. Oh, wow, it's good to go to Rom Romanesque. And I explained Romanesque is the central vision, not the peripheral vision. And you have a color, texture, and so on. The Gothic that go go comes later is, it, it is uh, after that is produced by the intensification of the vision and we started using a peripheral vision. Everything lost colors and we have light and movement. And we have Gutenberg in 1414. So Gutenberg with the movable metal uh, press, or be, uh, movable uh, <laughs> metal press, exactly. Talent possible, the book as we know now, is no longer the book as made one by one by as manuscripts, but it was the, almost an industry of books, no? Is in serial uh, production. And this changed, changed again the world and changed our brains, uh, changed physiologically our brains. And what we have, for example, Leonardo da Vinci. Of course, we had also Chimabue, we have Giotto, we have so many others, amazing people. And I, I I devote almost one book to all this, uh, these people and uh, Florence and Lorenzo in Magnifico and all this ma magnificent work. But we see what is the criticism of culture here. For example, this image by Leonardo da Vinci, Salvador Mundi from the 1500s. Notice that the hands and the ball, crystal ball, are focused, very well focused, but not his face. We have a depth, a depth of fields. The same phenomenon of the photographic cameras. It's not amazing in the year 1500s. What is this? This is the criticism is the, to understand our senses. Is this is the sense of art is when we put in check and we um, reveal ourselves. We see, for example, in the sculpture, we had Michelangelo. This is the V from 1504. That is the same epoch, the same time. Look at the body, the movement. It looks almost impossible to have been made on stone. You know? the stone is not easy to work because if you have uh, uh, weight in one side and not one, it broke, so it breaks. No? And it's so wonderful because this structure comes from inside to outside, is relations. So what happened? In the beginning of the 19th century, we had a genius in England that was Michael Faraday. And Michael Faraday imagined the world as all connected through lines of force, invisible lines of force. And he's, he was right. In fact, is this what happens? Everything is connected physically in the physical world. And James Clark Maxwell, in the later, no, they were friends, using this theory, this vision of the world to explain the electromagnetism. But Charles and Spurs did the same with the structure, the signal structure he created to understand how the ideas are shared among us. It's not beautiful. It's invisible, but it's true, it's concrete. And this starts is the same moment we have photography, cinema, telephone, uh, radio communication, the beginning of all that. And the beginning in the end of the 19th century of the quantum mechanics quantum physics, that's wonderful. It's changing. It's the first time we change the Aristotelian principle of the third included, and we have now the, the third excluded, and now we have also the third included. But more than that, for example, just to give you an idea about the importance and the impact of this, Schopenhauer, that is from this time also, he wrote a wonderful book where he says that if you have 
uh, causality, why we don't have also a telecausality? Can you imagine what is a telecausality is? And it's proven that we have in physical terms. But I explain this and much, much more in the books. Here we have an image, for example, just to give you an idea about the transformation of this world we live, no? That now is crazy. <laughs> the map of the internet in 2007. This map is, shows only the connection between servers at that moment. Can you imagine now in 2021, uh, how the, this structure is, is changing? No? It's another thing. And here we have an artwork by one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. For me, he was a brilliant genius, absolutely genius. This is Oliver Stone by Joseph Boyce. And is a piece for the world peace, is a work for the world peace. Okay, forget. In the book, I explain exactly what is that because he made many things to arrive to that point. And when you know the story, you get in love of that. No, you say, wow, this is really fantastic. But now look at that and in having in your mind Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo or other guys. And you say, wait a minute, this is a box of stone. The world changed again. Okay, and in the books, I need to finish now because you know, if I don't finish now, I will not, I will not finish, no, ever. Yes. So what is interesting here, in the, bo the book is covers 200,000 years of human, what we call human. And uh, for example, many people don't have in mind that great part of the <laughs> great part of the of the time of the last thousands of years, we live it in a mystical world. Many times we don't have in mind that music was science, not art, and so on. How all, do, all those transformations happened? And uh, the book is in at Amazon in paper or free at uh, academia.edu. And you can have all the links in the, in the website of the, of the fifth dimension. So again, thank you very much. I hope I was not too boring. And so I'm at your disposal. You know what? It was very interesting, Emmanuel. I, I could tap your brain for hours. Um, what I'd like to do is, is open it up for questions. And I believe Marinella would like to open up with a question. So let me turn it over to her. And just a reminder for everybody, I do have the links to the access of his books about Harris City and also the Hera TV, so you can see um, uh, this video if you want to share it with others. So, Marinella, did you have a question? Well, I would have hundreds of questions. Emmanuel never stops amazing me <laughs> uh, for years, and he knows that. That's why I invited him to be the coordinator of our observatory for the future of humanity. My question to you, Emmanuel, today is that you are. Uh, May putting in a review in these 30 books, 200,000 years of humans, of humanity. We have this observatory for the future of humanity that you know it's going to be a, a game changer in what can the, the, the future of humanity be in terms of re reflection, debating, and actually uh, putting into, into action. Uh, so, I would like you to, to answer in just a few words, how would these books contribute for our observatory? So, what is to observe? This is the first question no, we need to make to ourselves. And uh, the, uh, as I, I wrote in the website of the observatory, the etymological root of the word observatory, observation, is linked to the care we have for something. 
we need to have a care for the world, for the planet. We are living in a moment, a very strange moment in the world. Economy is, uh, is human connections. Mm -hmm. So uh, observatory is to learn and to take care about who we are. So I was in this year, you know, because you know, I wrote this, these were courses I gave at the foundation, Kalus Grubaken Foundation in the 90s. And I had written at that time, but it, there were 4,500 pages. And I said, well, wait a minute, I, I no longer have time to pass this to English and to publish. But the virus gave me this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the historical moment we are living, it's uh, very important to pay attention, to take care of what we are, who we are. And this is, in my point of view, is the basic function of the observatory, is to learn, because we all learn. We never teach. Galileo Galilei said that, and we are all learning. And so I think that is, was very, how can I tell you, very uh, precise the, uh, or, and very good the relation between these books and the observatory. Do you agree with me? Sure, I agree. Uh, and I would like that uh, the other people that uh, are here listening to you uh, would have the opportunity also to comment on the exposure that you just uh, had on the 30 books uh, that you are presenting today here online. Uh, well, the so questions are open to everyone. And yeah, I think, I think Nathan's comment? raising. Yeah, I think Nathan is raising his hand. So. Well, I, I'm of course I'm just uh, in awe of the scope, the depth, and the originality of your work, your your synthesis. Thank um, you. I'm with an organization that for many years has been working with young people, uh, the few that dare to lead, that dare to take a stand and uh, try to do something about the state of the planet. Some of the young people that were involved in creating the organization that I serve, their point of view was, don't wait for adults to clean up this mess join us, take action now. But the even more key statement they're making is let's up our game. Let's develop the skills and not be content with, you know, our, our present level. And above all, the skills of communication, uh, the networking. And as one observer noted, in our, in our one of our subfield is biomimicry. One of the superpowers that we humans have is the power to cooperate. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there's such a, a bundle of gifts in your research, in your synthesis that you have to offer to young people that are seeking new ways of cooperating, new ways of bridging some of the cultural, uh, social, and ec economic divides that uh, are keeping us apart, when in fact, like nature, that should be the stuff of biodiversity, the stuff of possibility, of invention, because our differences are a gift. Our diversity is a gift, it, but leaders and and the short-sighted are using our differences to divide us. So I would really welcome, since this is being recorded, what might you say to say some of the people under the age of 20 that we're working with and that are on a mission to tackle some of the problems pressing humanity today? So, Nathan, we don't know each other personally, isn't it? Do you know each other? I think not yet. No, no. I've been looking forward no, no, no. to meeting Thank you. Thank you so much. But, so but Emmanuel, much so, you, so that you know, Nathan is one of our partners for HERA. 
and he okay. is uh, he runs the uh, geoversity okay wonderful i love it everything you said and you know it's you are so right i i agree totally agree with you that in the book in the beginning i explain that this book is open everything there is a hypothesis to be discussed to be refuted to be rewrite to be to be worked by people it's open mm -hmm. and uh, i don't know if i would have a talent uh, to make you know we have i don't i have, for example i'm not a politician i agree with what you said about politicians and i totally agree and they put everyone to feel uh, to authorize people and to divide people and so on i agree to, in, totally with you but this is one thing that I have no talent to, to do. And I don't know how could I, I don't, I, 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 I follow nature. But you asked me what I, I would say to young people, and I say many times, because I'm, I'm also a teacher, no? I'm invited to give lessons here and there. So, and what I tell to them is read, read. Read, 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 read. The maximum you can is a sensory exercise for our brain. Is from this development, and I think that's, for example, I, I tell you a secret. <clears throat> Not a big secret, but <laughs> <laughs> in uh, some years ago, I was. I wrote a book. I published another book. I published many books already, and that was the Grasshopper Man. And I explain exactly about the prefrontal, but in political terms, what is happening in the planet. But this is another story. And uh, at that time, I met and I become friend of a minister in Switzerland. I live in Switzerland. And uh, he was a very interesting person. And he said to me, Manuel, what can, can we do in the world and in the planet so I can help you and so on? Let's go. I said, okay, we need to create a tool, a technological tool, so good as the book is, to uh, give us this dimension, this to improve our fifth dimension, as to say. And <laughs> I think that he did not understand what I. I said, <laughs> but I think that we need a new technology. If you see what you have, for example, in electronic uh, media, for example, we are losing all our uh, civilizational tools. And what I think is that we should not left anything. We need to uh, aggregate and go on. Uh, and so what I would say to, to young people is to read, 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 read. That I think that's very important. Not, and also go to electronics, go to virtual reality. I was one, I participated in the team that launched with Tim Berners-Lee, the World Wide Web in uh, 1989. Hmm. And I started working with virtual reality. That is my field on architecture and music in the 70s. Imagine a time that no, nobody spoke about that. No, they, they did not know. People thought that I was mad. I think that they were right, but this is another thing. You know? <laughs> so yeah. I'm not Very against true. anything, you no, know? but I'm in favor of uh, a technological tool that is the book that we, we should not left uh, uh, disappear. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Does anybody else? We need to meet personally. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you guys so, does, any, does anybody else have a question? A little quiet. I've got one for you, Emmanuel. So, um, what was your personal experience in writing 4,500 pages in two years? My experience. So <laughs> at that time in the 90s, 
I work in the night, during the nights. Uh, because I work as I work even now. And, uh, but it, it was a challenge. I had been invited to make these courses for teachers at the Carlos Kubeke Foundation in Lisbon. And they, I thought to myself, it's, I need to devote great attention to that. This was one <laughs> sensation of that complete involvement and so on. Then last year in 2020, I need to confess to you, sometimes I suffer because I'm not a translator. No? I write in English and I write in Portuguese. I write in Italian also. But that was written in Portuguese and I needed to translate into English. Wow. So it, I suffered a lot because it's not my field. I'm not a translator. No? So it was terrible. Some moments it was too uh, very, very heavy. But okay, uh, when we make for love, everything goes, no? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't like this expression, everything goes is too heavy. But when we make for love, we, you know, love <laughs> it's okay. Yep. So how are these uh, well, published? Uh, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Emmanuel, this is a difficult one that I have for you. Wow. How do you foresee the future of humanity? Tell me. You, you ask me in short, short term or long term? The now? The future in one, two, three in years? One or in the one thousand years? In one minute from now. It's already a future. No, what I think that is. Uh, we, I think that it, it will be very difficult for the next times because we have uh, overpopulation in the world. Uh, we have a fight between groups of interests, big corporations. Uh, we have less and less attention to education. Uh, people are more and more involved with magnetic and hypnotic uh, entertaining. Inter we have lived in a world of continuous entertainment and continuous consumption. And entertain entertainment is absence of thought. Entertainment is not sport, for example. Now people say to me, oh, I love tennis. No, I say, oh, do you play tennis? No, 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 I love to watch tennis. No, no wait a minute, this is not sport, it's the ball. Ping, 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 ping. It's the same in the uh, court, no, in football. No? That is not the American football, but even so, it's the same thing. You are looking, you are stopped there, and your uh, mirror neurons are working, uh, mimi, uh, uh, they made a mimesis of what they are looking at, but your body is not moving. And the same happens to everything that is entertainment. You don't think. You smile, you laugh, but you don't think. And they think that this is an emptiness we have in our planet that is terrible, especially with the young people. And the young people will be our future. They are our, fu our, our future. So if you have this reality, it's very difficult what you have ahead. The future is not good now, but I believe in, I believe in the human being. I believe in the human being. I have, I'm absolutely sure that more before or after we will have a transformation, a good transformation as we always have. Look at the history. Yeah. We always, we, we, were, we live it, transformations and transformations and we got better and better, better in all senses. Improve, we improved our life span. We have more knowledge. We, we have more every, everything. People are living much better now than in the past. We have more freedom now. You imagine, for example, can we imagine to have slavery, for example? It's something that is, like unbelievable. we have today yet, no, but it's unbelievable. Or the women, how, how the women uh, was treated over 
thousands of, uh, thousands of years. No, we are the same thing. We're the minerals. So I believe in the human being, but I think that we are li living now in a very difficult moment and in the near future will be difficult too. Okay, thank you for your for your answer, it was very clarifying. Uh, uh, everybody knows, and I mean, most of the people who are attending this session knows that we are working for a better world and a better future for humanity. So we are doing our part and we expect that everyone can do their part too. And uh, that's what uh, I, I sincerely hope because we are actually living very difficult times. Only yeah. God knows how we will survive through all this. So thank you very much, Emmanuel, for what you are doing, contributing for the, this uh, future of humanity, because your information is very, very helpful. And uh, as you, you are telling us, read, 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 because reading, you are being informed, and information is the best you can, you can have. Yeah. It's the richness, you know? It's yeah. the... the it's the richness uh, that uh, you, it's the only one, actually. Yeah. Thank you so very you much. I think that we are closing, no? Well, we're no. getting close to close. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew where to get your books. Okay. I already have mine. <laughs> Well, there you go. So where, where do they buy your books, Emmanuel? Is it at the website that oh, I- it's on Amazon. No, Amazon. I, Amazon. Or free at academia.edu. You have both options. You can have free all books. There's not a problem. Wonderful. Because there are too much. No, it's, you know, too many books. So 30 books. So oh, wait a minute. <laughs> so you can have free. There's not a problem. The function of the book is that, is to we spread out information and communication. It's not to make money. If I, <clears throat> I was a Nobel Prize, okay. No? So I would sell lots of books and I could make some money. <clears throat> no one knows me, so <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> no one knows that uh, uh, it's okay. We have time now. Yeah. <clears throat> I thank you, thank you <clears throat> very much, you all. Thank so you. we're at the top of the hour, and I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, you can, you know, save the notes below in the Zoom. Um, we'll also be posting this in Hera TV, and um, we will have upcoming sessions on how we're going to build out Hera City. And so we want to get the voices from everybody to tell us what you would like in a city that's based on the future of humanity. So. Um, with that said, I'll, I'll let everyone go. Thank you, Emmanuel, for your Thank discussion. You it was really great. Marinella, for your leadership. So we're very grateful that you joined us today. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, you all. Thank you. Ciao, Lili. Thank, thank, thank you, Emmanuel. Obrigado. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. <clears throat>